welcome. And thank you for joining us for the skepticism around clinical trials panel this afternoon. I hope that everyone's getting some lunch. Um, my name is Chris Shin, and I'm an associate professor of gender, sexuality, and women's studies, as well as the director of VCU's Humanities Research Center's of Health and Humanities Lab. The um, Health Humanities Lab fosters interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary research collaborations that center on better understanding and critiquing systematic and structural inequities that produce health and healthcare disparities and on imagining and enacting alternatives. Um, we welcome your participation in our monthly meetings. Um, I'm also the scholar administrator of the Office of Health Equities History and Health Program. Today's panel has been organized as part of an online history and health educational module on skepticism around clinical trials, being designed by undergraduate Health Humanities Lab fellows as part of the History and Health's Equitable Access to Care series. It will be recorded and posted on the module, which will include readings and reflection questions on clinical trials. The Health Humanities Lab would like to thank Ronnie Sisaveth, Christina Stanchu, um, Director of the Humanities Research Center, Logan Betrovich, and the Office of Health Equity History and Health Program, and Scott Berniger, Dean of the Honors College, for enabling the fellows to engage in this research opportunity and bringing together this panel. Another group of fellows will be organizing another panel on mental health in April, so please keep your eyes out for that event. I'd like to extend a warm welcome and a big thank you to the panelists who took time from their very busy schedules. I think Dr. Rondell is still in surgery scrubs, so thank you um, for joining us today. Um, the panels, panelists include um, Dr. Leslie Randall, who is a Diane Harris Wright Professor of Gynecologic Oncology and Division Director for the Division of Gynecologic Oncology, Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology um, at, at VCU's Massey Cancer Center. Dr. Randall earned her medical degree at the University of Louisville School of Medicine and her Master of Science degree in Advanced Clinical Research at the University of California, San Diego. She completed her obstetrics and gynecology residency at the University of Louisville School of Medicine Oh, sorry. Um, she is a passionate clinical investigator and is the current cervical cancer clinical trials lead for gynecologic oncology group partners in the GOG Foundation. She also serves as the Ovarian Cancer and Developmental Therapeutics Committees for NRG Oncology. Dr. Randall conducts patient-oriented research for all gynecologic malignancies with a focus on ovarian, cervical, and endometrial cancers. She has an extensive research background with experience in the design, conduct, analysis, and reporting of early to late phase trials, including both therapeutics and surgery. So welcome, Dr. Mandel. Thank you. Um, Happy to be here. Um, Sharon Rivera Sanchez, welcome, um, is the founder and chief executive director of Trials of Color and Saving Pennies for a Cure, nonprofit um, 501c3 organizations. The mission of Trials of Color, which was founded in 2022, is to educate, advocate, and empower cancer patients with a primary focus on diversity in clinical trials, awareness, and prevention. In 2015, Ms. Rivera Sanchez was diagnosed with triple negative breast cancer. She participated in two clinical trials, one in California and the other at University of Pennsylvania. Ms. Rivera Sanchez was also the primary caretaker of her younger brother, who lost his battle to colon cancer in December 2021. Since then, she has become a vocal educator around colon cancer and advocate for screening in the Black community. She, um, prior to um, founding and directing Saving Pennies for a Cure, um, she worked in sales and business management for 15 years with a, le a leading insurance and financial service institution. She serves on a number of boards and is also a 2022 project lead graduate. Thank you for joining us for today. Thanks for having me. Our last panelist, um, who is running a little bit late, but, but will be able to join us, we're hoping, is um, Dr. Sandy Brooks, the Director of the Human Research Protection Program at VCU's Office of the Vice President for Research and Innovation. She came to VCU from the U.S. Department of Veteran Affairs, Office of Compliance and Business Integrity, where she was Director of National Compliance Policy. Previously, Dr. Brooks was the Research Ethics and Compliance Officer with the Air Force Medical Readiness Agency, and she has held the positions of Director of Research Programs and Clinical Ethics Advisor for the Department of Research Programs at Walter Reed National Military Medical Center. She has also worked with the Department of Health and Human Services Office of Human Research, Office for Human Research Protections. So, um, and last but not least, I'd like the undergraduate health humanities um, fellows who are working on the clinical trials module to introduce themselves. Um, all the fellows worked on writing the questions that are um, being posed today, but one of the students, um, Aria, who will introduce herself, will be facilitating the um, questions and the discussion. 
So um, in alphabetical order, if you could all please um, introduce yourselves. Good afternoon. My name is Arya Hanjagi, and I am a first year bio student with a minor in chemistry on the pre-med track. Um, I am going to be the moderator for today, and I'm joined here with my fellow honors fellow, with my honors fellows who um, also um, are part of this module. Hello, my name is Naomi and I am a psychology and sociology student and I am going to be, I'm working on the legislature, legislature portion of our clinical trials module. Hi, I'm Emma Geisler. I'm a fourth year undergraduate student in interdisciplinary studies with focuses in psychology, sociology, and Spanish. Um, and I am working on the advocacy portion of our clinical skepticism around clinical trials um, learning module. Hi, my name is Neha Patla, and I'm studying biology with a minor in chemistry on the pre-med track as a part of the Guaranteed Medicine program. And I will be researching treatment disparities for clinical trials for our learning module. And hi, everyone. My name is Grace Smith. I am studying biology, chemistry, and Spanish on the pre-med track in the Guaranteed Admissions program for medicine as well. And I am researching the historical precedents related to clinical trials. And thank you all for being here today. Uh, we appreciate it so much. So um, the first question I have is just a general question for everyone. Um, in your opinion, why are clinical trials important? And why is it important for people from marginalized communities to participate in clinical trials? Okay, I'll go first. I'm Sharon Rivera San Sanchez. Thanks for having me. Clinical trials is extremely important in order to actually find a cure. That's number one. Also to find out if it's a medicine clinic, medication clinical trial, to find out do we have new medications that will work, um, work better, you know, in reference to um, some of the side effects with chemo. So um, clinical trials is very important. And in reference to the different community, we always want to include our black and brown community when we look in at when we look at um, diversity in the community. Plus, our bodies and our the chemicals are our bodies are made up different. So we don't know if one drug work on our counterpart will it really work on us in the black and brown community. Yeah, I would have to totally agree with exactly everything that you said. And I can tell that, Sharon, you do this like all the time because you know, really, I mean, that gets to the heart of the argument for me as well. The reason that, you know, I've devoted my career to doing clinical trials is because that's the only way that we make progress. So, you know, when I was a fellow, you know, I'm learning, you're, you're scrambling to learn everything, all the treatments, what the standards of care are. And it doesn't take long until you figure out that we could be doing so much better. Like this, this treatment I'm asking this patient to take is not only pretty toxic, like it actually doesn't work as well as you would think it would if it's the standard of care. And that's not true in all situations. Like sometimes treatments that we have as standards of care can be curative, but in the situations where you don't have a curative treatment, it's really on us to figure out what's better, especially if something's really toxic. Like I give a lot of um, the type of chemo that makes people lose their hair. Mm -hmm. um, well, okay, if that's gonna cure me, you know, when the chemo's over, your hair will grow back. It, it grows back every time. I've never seen it not grow back. But if this is not going to cure me, maybe I don't want to go through that. Maybe there's an easier way where I don't have to like have my identity stripped of me to not even be cured of it in the end. Like maybe there's a better way. And clinical trials are the only way. They're the only way, period, that we figure that out. There's no way to get a new treatment without a trial, right, Sharon? There's just no way. Absolutely. Absolutely. We can talk about a new drug 
all the all we want, but until we try it in patients, we do not know will that drug work. Right, exactly. And the and to approve, like in the United States, the FDA approves our drugs. They require a drug to be studied in a certain way. When we do clinical trials, we have to go to the FDA right. and show them this is what we're going to do. Is this okay? Is this going to get our drug approved? If not, let us know what we need to do because we don't want to waste all the patient's time and not get this drug to market for the patients that come after them. So well, that we have to do it in a certain way. Right. And it's not easy to get a clinical trial approved. It is not easy at all. And with regards to the marginalized populations, I agree with everything that you said. That's exactly why we need to have diversity of physiology of patients in our clinical trials because they may have different effects. It may you know, work for some and not work for others. It may have different toxicities in, in different types of people. And it's not just a color or a race thing. It's a, it's a socioeconomic background. It's all kinds of differences in our physiologies. You want patients of different ages on your clinical trials because they have different physiologies. Say you're studying a hormonal treatment in breast cancer, another hormone sensitive cancer, you want patients who are in menopause and who are not yet in menopause. You need like some diversity in how their bodies work um, to know if that drug, if those results will like apply to everybody when you're ready to give this medicine um, as a result of that clinical trial. Thank you so much, Dr. Randall and Ms. Sanchez. Uh, thank you for your insight on that. Um, so I have some questions for you, Dr. Randall, that I'll start off with. Uh, could you describe some of the clinical trials that you've conducted or that you're currently conducting? And how would you describe these clinical trials to your patients? And how would they agree to participate? Or how do they usually agree to participate? The most important thing that for me when selecting trials to offer to our patients is that they have a very good chance of having a high a, a high benefit for the patients. Um, and we do that in a couple of ways. Number one, we run a lot of phase three clinical trials that are drugs that have already been studied. They've shown good promise. They've shown reasonable tolerability. And so these are the big trials that will allow these drugs to get approved by the FDA and for other patients to access them. So those for us are our highest priority trials for our patients. The second priority is um, early phase trials, drugs that we haven't really used yet, drugs that we haven't tried yet. They have to have a lot of um, rationale, like something, it's going to be really helpful to patients when we, what we call the preclinical setting. So that's before it gets to patients. So it has to like make sense sort of scientifically and, you know, all that training that I did, like, and all this experience that I have, it takes a long time to learn, like how to pick those out, but you can start to really pick those out as you build a research program and bring those options um, to patients. I don't like to ask patients to go on a trial that I don't think is going to be very helpful to them. Um, and I won't open a trial if we know or we have some information that eh, this drug does not really work that well. Like we're not going to bring that to our program um, because we want patients to have, you know, a reasonable chance of being helped by these drugs um, as they participate in the trials um, because there are no guarantees and we can't make any guarantees. But what we can do is stack the deck in their favor by bringing them drugs that have already shown promise or that have good rationale and have reasonable chance um, of being uh, beneficial. So those are the main types of trials that we run. And we have a huge, we call it our, I call it our portfolio of the different studies that we have. Um, you know, I feel like I can't treat, I can't provide good care to my patients without clinical trials. And they're my number one choice for treatment option. Um, if they're available. So we try to have a clinical trial in sort of every kind of disease space that we treat. And I'll give you an example of what that means. So we treat our most common cancer in women's cancer is uterine cancer. And I only do below the belt, by the way, I don't do breast cancer. So I only do uterine ovary cervical. So uterine cancers are most common and some patients can be cured with surgery. So those patients don't really need a clinical trial. They need a good operation and we provide that. 
for patients who can't be cured with surgery that need chemo after surgery or patients who have um, tumors that make them not eligible for surgery, um, we have trials in those um, different spaces for those patients. Um, for their first treatment, usually it's a big trial, a big phase three trial for if they if multiple treatments haven't worked for them, then sometimes then they're going on to these like phase one trials where these are newer drugs because we've tried everything that we know that ought to work. It didn't. So now we're going to try something that's totally new and outside the box because the usual stuff didn't work, if that makes sense. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Um, so in order to make sure that all of your patients are getting um, what is best for them and what's really going to benefit them, um, what are some important ethical considerations that physicians like yourself will take into consideration when you're conducting a trial? Well, the first thing ethically is that you can't guarantee they will benefit, even if you think that they will. And to me, I feel like that's the hardest part for um this is where health literacy really comes in. And this is where we create, we have gaps. And this is where, you know, people like me, we get so focused on the science, like we forget. Um, we don't, you know, we have to walk across that gap and we have to fill that gap. And that gap can be small and that gap can be large. The more technical all these new treatments get, the larger that gap is getting. Um, so we have to make sure that we're trying to explain these things in a way that um, patients understand. I don't, I think this is the best thing. I don't know for sure that this is the best thing. Um, we monitor them closely so that if it's not working or if it's not the best thing for them, we kind of pull them out of the trial early. We don't wait, you know, a long time. Um, but bridging that sort of information gap. I think ethically is really, really um, important. You don't want to overpromise the benefit, uh, but you don't want to undersell it either. And I'll tell you in the, you know, we try to be very, very ethical and not oversell. And I think that we do, um, I think that we actually don't do trials justice as doctors because we're so worried about overselling it that we end up underselling it most of the time. Um, and I think that's really important where Sharon comes in because Sharon like is advocating for us not to undersell it. Like don't undersell it. Like if you think it's going to be helpful, then these patients need access. And that's how we've created a disparity gap in clinical trials because we've been more afraid to oversell it in a vulnerable population or a marginalized population. We don't want to overpromise to a marginalized population. And we've gotten, and I don't mean me because I'm not, but as a, as a, as you know, physicians in general have gotten afraid to ask uh, patients in marginalized populations to participate in clinical trials. So they're getting un, you know, unintentionally excluded. And these are biases that we're all working now to overcome and to like come back to the center on, you know, you're underselling it for the wrong, you know, a, a disproportionate groups. You're underselling it disproportionately. You need to be, we need to be in the middle. We need to not undersell it or oversell it. And we need to present it to um, all groups equally and in the same way. Uh, but I think, you know, ethically, that's the hardest part is sort of walking that line, like being in that exact middle ground. It can be hard to know where that exact middle ground is, if that makes sense. And I'm happy to answer follow up questions on these answers, too. Yeah, uh, I can see how that's a really tough call to make as a physician or just um, anyone who's trying to get the best care for their patients, um, but also trying to. Um, I guess, see what's going to work and where improvement can be made. Um, so on that, what uh, is the process that you go through in making a clinical trial? And some, what are some of the things that you have to um, really consider and pay attention to? You mean when you're designing the trial? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is, it's a huge process. It requires a lot of skill. Um, it requires a lot of training and experience. Um, you have to start out doing this like under supervision by a mentor. And then over time, you get to where you can do this on your own. Um, you never 
design a trial as a, a person, like an individual, you um, do it as a group. Um, you do it with um, other scientists, other uh, doctors, clinician scientists, and then you do it if you're, you know, if you want the best trial, you do it in conjunction with community members like um, like Ms. Rivera, who can give you like the patient perspective on, okay, this is how a patient's going to respond to this. This is what they're going to be concerned about. This is going to be their priority. This is a bad idea. This is a good idea. Um, the second thing is, so we, you know, decide which, you know, medicine or what, whatever approach we're interested in. Um, we decide which population this is, have the potential to help the most. We pick that population. Then we have to define like who's going to be included and who's going to be excluded from this trial. Those are called inclusion and exclusion criteria. Um, you can really make or break a trial when you when you design these criteria. If you so I have a clinical trial that is an immunotherapy trial that's only for black women because black women have been excluded from our immunotherapy trials passively, like we talked about. Um, but they're the patients that need immunotherapy the most. So for them, we have the least information. So here at Massey, we have a trial that's only for them. And we, um, if say, if I put in the exclusion criteria, hypertension, diabetes, um, as exclusions, well, I'm shooting myself and my trial in the foot because patients in the black community are going to have higher rates of hypertension and diabetes. So we have to make sure that it's necessary to include those. Hypertension patients can easily go on immunotherapy and we put them on immunotherapy every day. There's no reason to exclude them. So we did not put that in our exclusion criteria because that would make our trial not helpful or not relevant to the population that we're trying to study. So you have to think about those things as you design your trials and it's really, a big issue. It's funny. You would think that that's so easy, right? That sounds like it makes so much sense, right? But this is a problem. Um, this has been a problem for several years, and we're just circling back and saying, okay, we're really excluding these patients unintentionally from our trials by putting these exclusion criteria that don't really matter. So after you design that, then you decide what are your treatment groups. So in a big trial, normally we have an experimental treatment group with the new treatment, and then we have a control group um, that doesn't get the new treatment. In cancer, you can't have a placebo group in most cases. That's not ethical. And in some situations, a placebo is ethical, um, but in some situations, it's not. So you have to decide, is a placebo okay to do here or not? And then you decide what's the outcome that I'm interested in. And so for cancer, usually it's it's tumor shrinkage or it's survival time or it's quality of life or it's toxicity. And oftentimes it's all of them. And we pick like which one's the main one. We call that the primary endpoint. And then we look at all of those things because all of those outcomes are really important to our patients. And do you mind if I jump in here real quick? I just want to come back. I just want to That'd comment on something that Dr. Random said. Um, you first mentioned about um, the bias and um, underselling it. And mm -hmm. as a participant in two clinical trials, I was never given any type of guarantee. You also have to sign your document stating that as well. At one point, I said to my doctor, do you not want me to participate? And she yeah. said, no, but I have to tell you everything. Yeah. So I, I would say not to worry too, too much about underselling it, just ask the question. Because again, when we talk about health equity and things like that, you know, it was a study done on black and brown women and what they were saying that they was not asked. Mm -hmm. That was done by Stephanie Walker and it was presented at, at you know, at ASCO. So Stephanie, I would encourage everyone to ask. And also, I don't believe we're just talking about one clinical trial here. It's many types. It's a prevention trial, screening, supportive trial, medicine trial. So it's many types of um, clinical trials. So I just wanted to jump in and say that. Thank you so much. Um, Ms. Sanchez, I'll actually ask the next question for you. Uh, can you talk about your overall experiences in the trials and um, just add to what you were saying earlier? Okay. 
The first clinical trial was in California. I'm in Richmond, Virginia, and we did not have virtual at that time. You actually had to go there every 90 days. Um, so I went twice and um, that trial was going to get transferred. Sorry, they was going to open up another site in New York, Sloan Kettering. Well, that didn't happen. So when we start talking about barriers, that was really a barrier. It was no way that I could go to California for two years every 90 days. In fact, it was a company here in Richmond that actually sponsored me when I did um, go out there. So it's a group of us. We had a little group on Facebook and someone mentioned a trial at um, University of Penn. And I thought, that's great, I could drive there. So you could drive, but if anyone drive up north with the DC traffic, you have to bypass, you know, you have to time it just right. So it was a lot of barriers, but I was able to overcome those barriers. Um, I, I definitely believe and support um, clinical trials and feel that everyone should have the exact same opportunity that I had. And speaking of um, the clinical trial in Penn, they was actually looking for dormant cells and normally dormant cells can wake up, they can stay asleep, but if they wake up, now you're talking about metastatic. So I was afraid of that and that's why I joined um, a clinical trial um, to start with. So now we have Encore, here at Massey as well. We actually have Encor at 71, seven, I think it's 71 centers around the United States where we are actually trying to bring the trials to the patient instead of people having to drive or mm -hmm. catch a plane or train. So I got there any way I could and that went on for three years. Yeah, and follow up to that, that's really fascinating because I know if someone was working on the policy side of this, there's a lot of, you know, the clinical trials for COVID were decentralized and the patients could stay at home, they could do virtual visits, they could take the medicine at home instead of having to travel to these study sites um, to get treated. And there is a big push to allow decentralization of cancer trials. Mm -hmm. Um, and right now the way trials are set up, it is not, you can't get, even if it's a standard of care medicine, if it's being studied on a trial that I have open, you have to come to me in right. Richmond to get the treatment. But there are plenty of doctors out in the state that are perfectly capable of giving a lot of these medications. Um, and a patient could go locally and get, well, that would it tremendously increase enrollment. It would reduce the disparities that are that happen when patients who can't get to the center are excluded from the trial passively, but they're excluded, not included. Um, so that there is a lot of talk in front. I think there are a couple of bills in front of Congress right now. And I know that a lot of the patient advocates in our area have been going to lobby um, and, and it makes all the sense in the world. I mean, the COVID trials show that there's you know, it, it, you can monitor this if it's set up in a certain way and it can be done safely. Yeah, I was able to go to one appointment. It was like near my last one here to get the blood drawn. And it was like, wow, it was like the best thing ever that I did not have to travel. Yeah. And, you know, again, if you're talking about car, you're talking about bypass in DC, going to a doctor appointment, coming back, that's eight hours round trip. Wow, uh, that is a lot of hurdles for clinical trials, but I'm glad that over COVID, um, it became more accessible to a lot of people so that that doesn't keep on happening. And hopefully in the future, it can we can keep on progressing in that direction so that more people are included. Um, so how do you think that the history of clinical trials might have impacted why doctors are so concerned about not including uh, historically marginalized populations into these trials? The question for me? Uh, Dr. Randall or Ms. Sanchez, whoever wants to respond. Oh, you can start, go. <laughs> okay, all right. I think because it's just like she said, you don't wanna overpromise. So you are basically 
underselling it. That's one thing. You also are in, um, excluding us by saying diabetes and things that we are known to have. I don't have any of those, but the average person may have that. So that's why we only have for the last 16 years at any given time, four to five black and brown people participate in a clinical trial. And we de that should not be the case. We want the same thing as our white counterparts have. So, you know, it's based on how you write up the trial, what your, what your exclusion is. Um, you know, that's what I feel is why. And we also have to um, tackle what happened with Henrietta Lacks, Tuskegee, you hit the word guinea pig. So when a doctor bring that up, even a patient advocate, that's the first thing we're going to hear. I, I can assure you, um, I'm not going to be a guinea pig. Um, so you have to be able to address that and um, a way that people relate or they understand it. So one thing when Heretta lags, that was 1951, they did not have patients, black and brown patients that was sitting at NCI, Department of Defense, um, making a difference where we are looking at certain trials, our vote matter. We are taking part in grants. Um, you know, we are asking the question, you want to do what to this patient? And how are you doing this? Is this written in English as well as Spanish? We have a high Spanish population. You know, that alone could may, may get you declined, you know? So those are some of the things that we are doing now. We didn't have laws in place when all this happened. So it take people to explain that. We also, when we look at Tylenol, let me give you a good one. Now this, this one, you're a little young, but it's okay. So a long time ago, when you had a baby, if the baby was sick and they wanted to put the baby on clear liquid, it was Pedialyte, but you needed a prescription for that. You no longer need that because that was tested, you know, just like Benadryl, if you take Benadryl, if you take Tylenol, all those are medication that had to be tested. So when you explain that to a person, it's like, gee, I didn't know that. So it's a matter of having field people, having uh, boots on the ground, going out in these communities, explaining that to people. So that's why I think. Yeah, I think that's a great answer. And, you know, for my, as the physician, like, it's interesting position when you're a, you know, the clinical trialist and you're the physician, because my, you know, my commitment to my patient is to do no harm, first of all, right? And so that's why I can get into these um, conundrums about, you know, offering, a, there was a question and the question and answer that I answered, and it was like, why can you, why would you say something has benefit if you're supposed to have equipoise. So equipoise means if I'm the person running the trial, like I'm not, I'm doing the trial because I don't know if, you know, drug Z is helpful or not. And I don't, and scientifically I do have equipoise, but from a physician perspective, I know enough about that potential new medicine to know that it has a good chance of being beneficial. So I think, you know, when I talk to patients, I try to kind of meet them where they're at and I'm their doctor first. And I'm the clinical trial person second. Um, and you have to meet people where they are. Everybody, every single person in my door, no matter what color or sexual orientation they are, or what background they have, they come at you from every, everyone comes from a very different place. And so I try to, you know, listen to them more than I talk to them. And I introduce the idea of a clinical trial. And I tell them first and foremost, I hate the term clinical trial because it sounds so experimental. It sounds terrible. Like if I weren't in this business, I wouldn't want to be on a clinical trial. When I was learning about clinical trials, I didn't want my patients to be on clinical trials because I didn't know enough yet. And it just sounds so experimental. So I wish we called it something else. So I kind of acknowledge that up front and I let them like say, yeah, it does sound awful. Like I let them kind of get that off their chest because they invariably do need to get that off their chest. And then we can kind of like talk about, 
you know, this is, this is why I want, you know, this is why we have this trial. This is why we think it's important. And I just have like a very honest, real conversation with them about that. I think if you get into this, like very scientific, well, this trial's blah, 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 you know, and it's not, it's kind of a more sterile conversation and it's not a two-way street connection, then it can be very scary to, to commit to a clinical trial. Um, but I think that's how I start to kind of infuse my comfort level with the patient being on the trial with them is by having this sort of two-way conversation. Um, but you have to, Sharon, your point is so good. Like I have to have confidence that that trial is the right thing for my patient to do. If I don't have confidence in that, it will come through in this conversation. They will be able to read that mm -hmm. and they should be able to read that because they're using whatever they can use to try to figure out what is the right thing for me to do here because these are overwhelming decisions for these patients. Um, at a I think time. we don't we don't talk about the benefits enough of clinical trials as well. You know, you're monitored very closely, extremely closely, and mm -hmm. we're talking about cancer, a life threatening disease. Tell me one person that wouldn't want to be monitored. Now, yes, it's fun ringing the bell and running like heck. I want to say something else, but then you go home and you wait. And if you get an ache, it's like, oh, did it come back or what? But how about if you monitor so closely? How about having access to a new drug that came out that may help you? Or, you know, it could be weight loss. It could be, again, a prevention trial. So I, I honestly feel that we do not talk about, we definitely have to talk about the risk and we all talk about the risk, but we don't talk about the benefits enough. That's so helpful for me to hear. See that she teaches me. See, you all think I'm the expert on this panel and I'm not. I'm not neither. We're, well, it's a team, right? It's, right, it's really a, team. a team effort. And, right. and all these perspectives are really going to make us successful. And we've not been successful. Well, not, we're not unsuccessful. Like we, you know, cancer care is like catapulting right, right. now. And there are right. just trials everywhere. And, and they're accruing, they're, you know, people are going on these trials and all these new treatments are coming like faster than we can even learn about them. Um, I stay involved in trials so that I, when this trial, when this medicine comes, like I know how to take care of patients <laughs> getting it. Otherwise I would not be able to keep up with everything. But um, yeah, I think that's so important for us to hear. I wish Dr. Brooks was here. I guess she didn't make it because she brings this IRB perspective mm -hmm. and, you know, we're sort of because of Tuskegee and because of Henrietta Lacks and because of all the bad things that have happened, it's like we're still sort of may culpa, we we're still sort of paying for that, right? Like in a way by not, you know, not over overselling these, you know, potential benefits of the trial and really being very focused on, you know, these are the risks and these are the mm -hmm. potential downsides and being overly focused on the downsides and not focused enough on the upside or the, you know, the pros of being on the trial. And I think it probably, maybe it is, you know, some of this legacy, um, terrible things that have happened um, to folks that are, you know, horrible injustices and really criminal, um, you know, that, that would be criminal today. Like you could not get away with that. So, so the pendulum maybe has swung a little bit too far the other way. <laughs> I think it's coming back though. I think it's coming back to the middle. Like I think people are seeing how much progress, at least in cancer, we're making with these trials. And people like you, um, you know, Sharon, that are out there in the community and, and really educating folks at a community level, every every program that you encounter that has done a good job of enrolling minority patients to clinical trials has a community-based component where they're in the community all the time. They're not just in the community when it's time to go on a trial and they're not going away when the trial is over. Like they're right. in the community consistently. They're educating people on multiple levels, not just about cancer, not just about clinical trials, 
um, so that when it comes time for the cancer treatment or the clinical trial treatment, there's like a relationship there, there's a familiarity there, and you're not just coming at it from a cold, cold and call. When, yeah, and when you bring up clinical trials, in most, most instance, it's not just a 15 minutes conversation, and it may be multiple conversation. So mm -hmm. I think that's where I don't think that's where some of the advocates come in, because we can, we can do that sometime in the hospital setting, you know, based on how you schedule your appointment, you may not have that extra 50 minutes to go into history, right, right at that moment. So that's why I do think it's, um, it's a team approach. So we can lend our voice and say, well, hey, well, I have the extra hour, you know, or I can take the call and I can say, sure, I participate. You are really lucky. They have it right down here, down the street. You didn't have to worry about DC traffic and, you know, things like that. And again, just like you said, it's no guarantee, but, um, I'm eight years out and my doctors know they cannot release me. I'm not comfortable with, and I'll tell anybody, I'm not comfortable with the one year. You go to, you know, sometime over a hundred appointments and you think, okay, ring the bell. I don't have to come back. I, I am not comfortable with that. I, I like to be monitored. So if it's a clinical trial, sign me up so I can be monitored. We like that too. <laughs> yeah. Like that. Um, I definitely agree that um, curbing the skepticism that it's definitely gone down in recent years. It's definitely something that has to be done from both the physician level and the community level so that you have sort of um, like a scientific view on the topic and you're getting all your facts, but then you also have community members who have been through it and who know what the process is like and who can guide you through it. So uh, Ms. Sanchez, uh, what work do you do with your organization, Trials of Colors, um, for this very goal? We do um, prevention. We do educate, advocate, and giving back to the community. What I'm most proud of is like I like boots on the ground. You can't do everything behind a desk. Not everyone, when we talk about underserved, not everyone has a laptop. So we like to go out in the um, community. And recently I was out in the community and I put up Charles of Color banner and saving pennies. And I come to you with a financial background and that's what we was teaching. And in the middle of the class, someone said, hey, can I ask you a question? Can you really explain clinical trials to me? And two other people had the same question in what they was telling me. We see it on TV, but we really don't understand it. So that's where it goes back to having one-on-one -on -one and having that extra time to talk to a person. But so when we out in the field, we educate, uh, we have appointment Tuesday to go out and uh, we serve in pizza and we're gonna talk about prevention on colon cancer. Um, because again, I lost my brother about 14 months to colon ca cancer. And that's number two, that is actually taking out our black and brown community. Um, and that's one of the cancers that can be prevented. And my hashtag for that is get your butt check or you might regret. And I, we, we going out, we have these big old shirts with butts on the back in the blue ribbon. And we will be discussing that. And if they want to eat pizza while I'm talking about getting your butt checked, they, they welcome to do that. So, um, you know, again, going out in the field, when we advocate, a lot of times we lobby, we on Capitol Hill um, talking about bills, we doing virtual meetings um, like this and giving back. We have a blanket drive once a year and we also give um, back household and personal care items. But the most thing, like I said, is going out in the field really meeting a person where they are and taking the time um, to educate them. Even if it's one person at a time, we have a campaign through Massey C grant called Teach One, Reach One. So where we are teaching a person about prevention. And if they said, well, I'm too young, which is no such thing because children get, get cancer, but tell your neighbor or talk to your neighbor. So we telling them symptoms and things that they can do to pre, um, prevent, try to prevent 
um, be talking to them about screening. And most people are very grateful that we are taking um, to, uh, time to do that. I think a lot of times it depends on where the message is coming from and where the setting that they are in. So that's what Charles would call it and say, and Venice do. Wow, uh, that is amazing. That is so much um, going into making sure that um, people who are having clinical trial, who are doing clinical trials for the first time are informed in their decision, know what they're getting into. And then, you know, of course, that more people are more likely to participate in them. Thank you. Um, so what do, this is for both Dr. Randall and Ms. Sanchez. What would you consider your biggest successes to be? Um, Ms. Sanchez, you from the community perspective and then Dr. Randall from the physician perspective. The biggest success? Um, yes, in helping curb skepticism in clinical trials and just helping um, inform participants who can participate in them. The biggest success is actually having a voice um, that to go again back out in a community talking to people that look like me. Um, you know, it's like when they said guinea pig, well, I wasn't a guinea pig and I'm eight years later and I'm still here. And, you know, they'll look really puzzled, like, what are you talking about, lady? Um, so boots on the ground is uh, one of the biggest success. Um, I have many participating in a clinical trial, um, speaking on Capitol Hill. So I have many success and I will continue to be a voice for the voices. So that's, that's my success. Yeah, mine is twofold, you know, from a personal perspective, um, you know, we used to just be so focused on the science of these trials that we just weren't paying attention that, you know, we weren't putting black brown patients on our trials, we weren't putting LGBTQ patients on our trials, we weren't reaching them because we weren't focusing on their specific needs. And um, so, you know, that is success in and of itself is to say, hey, you know, time out. It, we're not doing a good job here. We have to fix how we're doing this. So, you know, we're on a totally different trajectory now. Like when I, when I do a clinical trial, um, I have to have a diversity plan. That's my rule and that's the FDA's rule. Um, we have to have a diversity plan. We have to, and it, and it should be very, in, in my opinion, it should be very, um, the, whatever disease you're studying, the diversity on your trial should mirror the diversity of the patient population that gets the, you know, for us, it's cancer. So if I'm studying uterine cancer, my clinical trial should reflect the diversity makeup of the patients who have it and the patients who are going to need that treatment. So I have to have a plan, you know, if I'm targeting um, an under a socioeconomically disadvantaged population, we have to have money for transportation for them. We have to have a way, I prefer for it to be decentralized. It's not that yet. So until then we'll pay for them to get to us. Um, we have to make sure we worked on those inclusion exclusion criteria. We have to have a, we have to open the trial in places where these patients are located. If we open it in somewhere that's totally irrelevant and we just sit and let the trial be open and it never puts any, or it just only puts like basically affluent white patients on, which is what we've been doing historically, then, you know, we're not meeting our diversity plan. And then from a, you know, a societal, like a medicine perspective, these clinical trials are, are saving lives. I mean, that is like no joke. Um, they are saving lives. We are curing patients that come in with stage three and four ovarian cancer, not all of them, but a portion of them. And we're, it, you know, we're just going to keep at it until we are curing more patients. Um, there are certain types of uterine cancer that have um, a, a biomarker called, it's called microsatellite instability. Well, you can cure several of those patients with immunotherapy um, that have stage four cancer. Um, so we used to never be able to even think about that. We couldn't talk about curing stage four cancer. We were lucky if our stage four patients lived a year or two and had a reasonable, I mean, they really didn't even have a reasonable quality of life. They would live two years, be off and on treatment and feel terrible the whole time. 
So we're actually like curing patients and it's because of trials. So we have to find a way to make this work. And we can't exclude, we can't leave patients behind because they're skeptical and rightly so about trials. And we haven't done a good job of communicating to them that it's safe and it has a reasonable chance of being effective. And if it's not safe, they being monitored so closely that, you know, you can pull them off it. Right. And they're not just monitored by the doctor that has them on the trial. They're monitored by all these people they can't Everybody. see. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. a data safety monitoring committee, like a trial steering committee. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if it's a registration trial for an FDA approval, the FDA is watching. Like right. it's monitored at so many levels for safety. Yeah. But that's definitely, you know, the big successes that I've seen recently. I'm so glad that the conversation around clinical trials and everything that goes into it has become so open that um, these developments are able to be made and all um, participants are able to, if they have any concerns, really get them out, get their answers, and then participate so that they can get what they need. Uh, how do you think that participants can take the information that they've learned today back to their workplaces and communities? And what advice would you both give people who want to get more involved with this topic? I don't know why she looked at me first, but anyway. <laughs> so we want to hear what you have to say. <laughs> I think basically they can just continue to it's, um, educate themselves on it, expand on it. Um, we are very easy. Trials of color are very easy to reach. We have trials of color on Facebook, um, you know, all the social me media platform, LinkedIn, um, Twitter, so they can reach out. I'm more than happy to um, answer questions, to come to their community. We can bring a whole committee down there if you like, because again, everyone knows someone that has been touched by cancer. It may not be you, but everyone knows someone. So we just continue to need to have that conversation and spread the conversation. It's just like Dr. Wynn would always say, um, Robert Wynn, who's over the Cancer Center, one team, one fight. It's not, you know, we, we band together and learn and um, expand from each other. At, you know, at the same token, I cannot stress enough that the way that the um, clinical trials are designed to make sure that the black and brown population is included, I will start designing, be part of a design team at the end of the month. This will be my first time. Um, make sure that as you thinking about a big um, design in a, a trial, what language is that trial in? You know, we have a heavy um, Hispanic, Hispanic population. Make sure that is included in there too. Um, some of the things that I look at is like, hey, is this just in English or is this just in Spanish? If you feel that you do not have or did not get enough information that you need, I can guarantee everybody on this panel is more than willing to give you additional um, information. In, you know, let me just say this that I didn't say. I was scared of a clinical trial, but I was more scared of the cancer coming back. So then I chose the clinical trial route. And in this case, it was medication. And the first thing I said to the doctor, I might get sick on the stomach. Are you going to give me some? She's very conservative. She's not giving you nothing. You can have a headache. You're not going to get it from her. So what I did was came home and I took a little piece of the medication first. That's how scared I was. The second day I did the same thing. I'm like, oh, I'm good. And I went ahead and took, took the whole thing. So I had to do some 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 psyching myself up as well, just to take the medication. But again, no one want to get cancer. No one want to be in the cancer club. No one want to be excluded. So ask us the question. Don't worry about downplaying it. It's no guarantee at all. It's cancer. It's a clinical trial. So. That's my takeaway. Contact anybody on here and feel free to contact us.
Yeah, I couldn't agree more. It's just the conversation, like, you know, the fact that this is bubbling up to the top of the conversation is great. You know, doctors need to talk about it more too. Not all doctors believe in clinical trials. Not all doctors put patients on trial or refer patients for trials. And, you know, in all of our conversations, we talk about normalizing things like clinical, it, clinical trials need to be normalized. This is just part of medical care. Every time I try a new drug on you, I don't know how it's going to work. Even if it's a standard of care drug off the shelf, that is a clinical trial. So putting a patient on an investigational clinical trial is really no different than just trying something out in the, in the office that you don't know if it's going to work or not. We don't know if any of this stuff is going to work. So we need to just continue to normalize the term clinical trials. And I haven't come up with a better term because I, you know, I don't like the term because I think it sounds scary. But, you know, the more we talk about it and the more we normalize it in our communities, um, outside of the medical, you know, world, outside of the medical sphere, um, I think the better we're all going to be, you know, the more successful we'll be. I agree. Uh, thank you so much for all of um, your answers and your insight into this topic. Uh, I think we'll move into Q&A now. Yes, thank you so much. Um, that was wonderful. I learned so much. And thank you, Arya, for facilitating and to the um, Undergraduate um, Health Humanities Lab Fellows. Those were some really insightful questions. Um, so we got um, some questions. I think one of them was answered in the Q&A section already. But we have a question in the chat um, from Blue Wool um, Woolbridge. What are potential pros and cons of the various means of communication with underrepresented minorities, including females and lower income whites, um, potential members of clinical trials? And what are some basic assumptions regarding each mode of communication? I'm assuming this is modes of communication to, to discuss the potential mm -hmm. of joining a clinical trial. Yeah, I can start with this one. Gosh, you know, it goes back to my comment where people come from you know, every single person's coming from a different place and you can't generalize really any of your communication efforts to any one group or any one person um, because that'll be your first mistake. <laughs> and, and, and this is where I listen a little bit more than I talk. Um, it, it, you know, I, you get enough sort of, you, you work with enough people and you get sort of a skill um, to, and I'm probably not perfect at it by any means. I probably still have a lot to learn, but you get better anyway at understanding where people are. And um, Sharon, you mentioned like meeting them where they're at. And I think you meant physically and sort of mentally meeting them where they're at. And um, you, you got to kind of meet people where they're at mentally. And I'll tell you that across the board, across all the different patient groups, it's, it's health literacy that is really sort of the barrier. So if I explain something and it's too complicated, and I've explained some things today that were sort of probably pretty complicated. Um, and sometimes I have to explain myself more than once to really see that someone is getting something and you have to explain things that are in lay terms enough that people can understand, but that are not overly simplified so that they are getting the true you know, the, the true presentation of what the potential risks and benefits are. Um, and that, you know, that takes time. Um, I'm probably not great at it. I don't know, Sharon, you probably have some communications tools that would even like help me. Um, but that, because the diversity of experience is so tremendous in my office, like I feel like I have to come at it from this generalized approach or otherwise, you know, I'll make assumptions about people that are just not true. And, and that is so true. I, you know, it goes back to what do that really mean, meet a person where they are? Like if you ask about a clinical trial and they start with, oh, no, do you know, tuxedo, hairy out of lax, say, tell me about it. Tell mm -hmm. me about it. Let's let's talk about it. And normally they'll tell you what they heard. So that's your chance to basically educate them and said, this is where you can find information 
or why don't you purchase a book and let's revisit this conversation. So just like I said, it takes more than one conversation. So the person that want to take this back to the community, I can guarantee it's going to take more than one conversation. And then you, you uh, a good um, thing is to team up with someone that actually has participated or team up with one of the doctors that can come down there and wherever you're at and answer the medical question. But I would say before you team up with the doctor, team up, team up with an advocate because mm -hmm. it's gonna take more than one conversation. No one's just oh gonna gosh. say, yep, sign me that, up. <laughs> that, that right there, that is like this, that's the key is that it's not one person. So I describe my communication style, but you're exactly right. Like the first thing I do is hand off to our study coordinator or our nurse navigator, because, you know, there are going to be things that I can address as a physician where they're going to want to listen. You know, if they want to talk about Tuskegee and they want to talk about Henrietta Lex, they may meet, see me as a person who instigated that. You know, not that I personally instigated that, but my profession instigated that. My profession did instigate that. So, you know, I may not be able or I might not, I'm probably not the best person to start opening up that conversation with them. Um, but our advocates are and our study coordinators are. And, you know, I think some of them may be on tape, but they'll tell you like there's so many things that the patients will tell them that they won't tell me. But for lots of reasons, for privacy reasons, or they don't want to, they don't want to upset me or let me down, or they don't want to make me feel bad about myself, which, oh my God, like, you know, I'm not the girl, I'm not the priority here, but, you know, people will protect a physician from knowing these things about them and they'll tell, they'll totally download on the nerves, <laughs> but that's good. You know, they need those safe spaces where they can talk and, and just like you said, you know, it's a team effort and you got to have more than one conversation. And in the process, because it's a process it with it, you know, as a, it hopefully the end result of the process is the patients participating in a trial. And I think the more the more skeptical they are, the more bad information they've been given or the more negatively they view trials coming into it, like the more time that's going to take. But it's so worth the effort. Right. Because then they pass it on, like you said. It's that, what did you say it was, Ms. Sanchez? It's the um, teach one. Teach what, one, reach one. one. Reach yeah, one. Teach one, reach, the reach yeah. one. Because you're not, you know, they'll they'll share that with all their friends and their family. Thank you. And we have some additional questions in the um, Q&A section, um, starting with Jessica Jones, who asks, how can information professionals such as librarians who work with clinical faculty help bridge the health literacy gap between clinicians and patients? That's such a great question. Yeah, I think people have different needs, but um, you know, working as a librarian, I think most patients are coming in with a specific interest or most physicians are coming in with a specific interest. Um, and, you know, just you being there <laughs> and knowing what that information is. And then if you don't know, you know, if it's like for what I do, it's so specialized and high level, like, you know, always feel free to reach out to the teams um, that are treating these patients to help, you know, how can we, what information can we provide? Um, I love, you know, Sharon, I love that you have this like tent or this banner, you're of your your trials of color your with your logo and it's inviting and you know I carry I have a button on my backpack from the AACR and it says clinical research saves lives mm. and I'm walking through the you know airport in Atlanta and this woman grabs me and gives me a hug because a clinical trial saved her life and I don't know her from anyone and it's like during COVID and everything but um you know I I think um Gosh, I, as much of these like little of these banners and information that we can have up in our like in the areas like the library, um, I think that engages people and helps continue the conversation. And I think she's in the perfect place. I like yeah. the idea that she's in the library where mm -hmm. instead of you using Google University, you can use real books and things like that and get information from that. 
and try to bridge the gap that way. Call, um, you know, also call upon the physician. You know, if it's a question that she can't answer or she's puzzled by or she's trying to bridge that gap because the library also have all these conference rooms that you can rent out and set up a meeting. So that to me, that's the perfect setting to try to bring people together. Mm -hmm. um, so for our last question, what it looks like to, um, our last question from Brett Brooks, um, as an investigator, how would you address a sponsor that you feel hasn't done enough to be inclusive if it, of historically excluded populations in their trial design? Could this be a deal breaker for a trial proposal? Oh, yeah, you're excited. About I'm that. laughing because it is a deal breaker. And I do this daily. I mean, I do this all the time. And, you know, it's funny because I we work globally on trials and um we from the United States are really having to teach the world about the importance of diversity in clinical trials. And they act like it's a United States problem. And it is not. This is a problem across the globe. So we've gotten pretty bold. Um, we being the, you know, the investigators that I work with and, and we're bold, we're emboldened because the FDA requires this. So it is at their peril as a sponsor if they don't address this. Um, and you know, especially in a place like VCU, like I came here to work with a more diverse clinical trial population. And, you know, I'm not going to participate in your study and we're not going to, you know, contribute patients to your trial if you don't address this. And you know, that carries a lot of leverage with sponsors because they're reliant on the study sites and the patients to participate in the study um, to get that study completed. So they're tremendously responsive. I know our team in particular has really leaned in on sponsors, like you have to cover transportation. We need you to cover this. We need to cover the translations of the consents. Like we want all of that up front right. um, because we don't want to, you know, make a contract with them and not, not put up front that this is a priority for us. And then later on them not really get... Uh, be responsive to us about it, but we just make it a priority from the very beginning. And if they won't prioritize it, we won't participate in their study. Yeah, because one of my questions is, how did they ever get that far? How did they get that particular uh, trial approved and they supposed to be sponsoring? All that should be written, document, very clear at the beginning, not in the middle of the clinical trial. You know, how are you going to recruit black and brown patients? What are you going to do if they, if someone two hours away and they want to travel for that? All that should be up front, not at the end. Oops. You'd be surprised. You'd be surprised that until recently, you know, when the FDA came out with that guidance, the FDA came out, issued its first guidance in 2012, and no one really paid attention to it and then kind of brushed it away. And it wasn't until, you know, 2020 when social justice became really back on the forefront that the FDA issued new guidance. And they said, okay, this time we're serious. You know, this time we mean it. And the guidance is actually not all that great. Like if you all that know a lot about getting black and brown patients on trial, read the FDA guidance, or if you have read it, you may have already read it. And it's not very you know, instructive or it's not, I don't think it's high impact. We're having to work outside of those guidelines to come up with our own high impact ways of getting black and brown patients on trial. But you would be surprised at how it hasn't really been prioritized until more recently. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I've never seen it this well prioritized. Yeah. And I think it's finally picked up the momentum that it needed to get over that hump to have staying power. You know, it would pick up momentum, it would pick up and then it would drop off and then pick up and then it would drop off. I think now we actually have some sustainability um, to the efforts because we have the right people at the table. We also never really reached out across the community gap. Um, and now, you know, with organizations like yours, Ms. Sanchez, like we're finally getting some some stability and some longevity to the effort. Thank you. Um, there's a question here from Carlotta Henry. 
who asks, please repeat, I think the, um, there's a typo, maybe info about Senate and decentralization. I don't remember comments about Senate, but I do remember about decentralization. Uh, maybe you can speak to that. Yeah, I think you might be asking about what the Senate bills are, maybe some specifics about that policy. Um, I don't know the specifics. I just know, yes, okay. I just know that they're working on these and I'm not very, you've got your legislature um, um, student on that may know more about this than I do. Um, I just um, talked to our advocates a lot and I know that they were going to meet with folks on the Hill to talk about um, to talk about decentralization. And I think that it's got a lot of traction. Um, you know, it, it had a lot of traction from COVID. There's a lot of traction because it is framed around the um, ability to enroll patients who are being excluded from trials onto trials. Like we are going to increase our diversity of enrollment if we can decentralize um, these trials. Yeah. Okay, are there, um, I don't see any other um, comments, but there is a request, please, for everyone to fill out the survey. And then a couple comments here, which is which I think are very fitting at the closure, which um, it's very helpful to hear the patient point of view. Thank you. And then a big, hello, Mrs. Sanchez, you are awesome. <laughs> from one of your many fans, it seems like. So um, I'd like to, I like, I'd love to close on that note. Thank you so much. Um, to both of you for um, coming today and really uh, offering so much information and um, reframing, I think, some central questions I think a lot of people have about clinical trials and um, addressing why there might be such a long history of hesitation um, that continues um, to this day and why it might be so important to try to reframe some of that um, hesitancy and encourage people to, um, especially um, my marginalized communities to start participating in clinical trials. So thank you again for joining us. Um, thank you um, again to the um, undergraduate lab fellows. You did you did great work um, helping to bring everyone um, together into this conversation. So. And thanks for having me. It was my pleasure. And again, if anyone want information about clinical trials or want me to speak about it or join the team with you to increase enrollment, feel free to reach out. Thank you. I think you might have some students calling you shortly to um, start working with you. Be prepared. No problem. They are more than welcome to. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Bye, you. Dr. Thank you too, Dr. Randall. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.